Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Public Health Preparedness for Health Centers, Navigating the Preparedness Landscape. I am Christine Ganella of the National Nurse-Led Care Consortium, and I will be moderating this webinar hosted by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council as part of their spring virtual training with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. This is a 60-minute presentation with the last 15 minutes reserved for Q&A. There is a chat box below the presentation slides for participant questions and technical issues. Please type your questions or technical issues into the chat box at any time during the presentation. A select number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Remaining questions will be logged and provided to the presenter for written responses after the webinar. If you are having technical issues, you may also call the Council's office at 615-226-2292 for assistance. This session is accredited for one continuing medical education credit hour through Vanderbilt University Medical Center. If you plan on claiming credit, please copy the information located in the CME Information Notes pod at the end of this session and follow the instructions. The text in code will only be available during this session. I am honored today to be joined by Gabrielle Grode, Evaluation Specialist with the Research and Evaluation Group at Public Health Management Corporation, Alexander Lipovsev, Assistant Director of Emergency Management of Community Health Care Association of New York State, and Co-Chair of the PCA Emergency Management Advisory Coalition, and Tina Wright, Director of Emergency Management at the Massachusetts Lead of Community Health Centers and co-chair of the PCA Emergency Management Advisory Coalition. We will spend the next hour discussing key findings from a National Public Health Preparedness Assessment of Health Centers conducted in late spring of 2017. Summarize the CMS Emergency Preparedness Rule requirements for health centers, and finally, highlight currently available resources for health centers to bolster preparedness efforts. We are delighted to have you join us today. The National Nurse Like Care Consortium is supported in part by the Health Resources and Services Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services through a National Training and Technical Assistance Cooperative Agreement. Additionally, NNCC receives funding from the CDC to identify how the aspects of health centers can be leveraged during response to a pandemic or other public health emergency. Our mission is to advance nurse-led care through policy consultation and programming to reduce health disparities and meet people's primary care and wellness needs. We provide training and technical assistance to primary care associations, health center control networks, and health centers and other safety net providers and stakeholders to enhance programming to meet the specialized health care needs of residents of public housing. The information presented in this webinar's contents and conclusions are those of the presenters and should be, not be construed as the official position or policy of HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. For more information about the NNCC, you can find us at www.nursedcare.org. We know that an integrated U.S. healthcare system would support overflow in hospitals and long-term care facilities, provide access to antivirals and other treatments, and educate those who may not need emergency care. Building upon expert recommendations of a systems approach to emergency planning and response, and national recommendations for local health systems to collaborate on emergency preparedness efforts, health centers must maximize the opportunity to integrate into local emergency response collaboration. Health centers which serve a major source of primary care to vulnerable populations nationwide are essential components of an effective response to a severe pandemic or disease outbreak. Beginning with our work with the nurse triage line with the CDC Flu on Call project, NNCC's work within the emergency preparedness spectrum continues to evolve. NNCC has partnered with the Research and Evaluation Group at Public Health Management Corporation and the CDC to assess public health emergency preparedness at health centers nationally. We have also expanded our engagement to include Tina Wright and Alex Leifusef, co-chairs of the PCA Emergency Management Advisory Coalition. In addition to the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, 
and the National Association of Community Health Centers. The activities we've engaged in to support this programming include what's listed here on the slide, nine key informant interviews, a poll of health centers, a report back of the findings from both the interviews and the polls, um, a case study which is still in development, a webinar series that we will be hosting this March, of which this is the first. Um, and we will also be hosting a, a learning collaborative open to health centers nationally um, that will run, I think we're scheduled to run it in March of um, March or April of, uh, of, uh, of this spring. Um, for more information about the learning collaborative, you can contact uh, the National Nurse Lake Care Consortium for additional information. Before I turn the uh, presentation over to Gabrielle, we're going to do our first poll of, uh, of the of the webinar. So we'd like to know from our audience on the webinar today what your role is at your health center. I think we'll give you about a minute to respond. Okay. Great. Let's register our responses, and then, and I think you can close the poll then. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to turn the presentation now over to Gabrielle Grode, and she will go over in more detail the, um, the needs assessment that was conducted um, in the spring of 2017. Thank you, Christine. I'm Gabrielle Grode with the Public Health Management Corporation, and I will be describing the public health preparedness assessment we conducted in 2017. This assessment included key informant interviews and an online poll, and the goal was twofold. First, we wanted to add to the limited knowledge base about the preparedness capacity and needs of health centers, and with a specific focus on pandemics and outbreaks. And two, we wanted to determine what training and technical assistance would be most helpful to the health centers, which is what this webinar series is all about. Our assessment covered six broad areas, emergency plans, infrastructure and supplies, exercises, relationships and communication, barriers and training needs. So our assessment included um, 19 informant interviews with health centers across the country and an online poll. And the interviews were done for two reasons. One, we wanted to gain some, some really in-depth information about health centers and preparedness and also to use the findings from the interviews to help us develop a poll that was really sensitive to the needs of the health centers and what they experience day to day. Our online poll was sent out to just under 1,400 health centers in the country, and 391 health centers responded for a response rate of 29%. And our respondents were very experienced. 70% had been in their position for more than three years. Uh, about one half of the participants were in a CEO or a COO role. Another 14% were in safety or compliance. And the remaining were mostly clinical or administrative staff. The characteristics of our participating health centers in terms of size, location, and number of sites that they operate were reflective of health centers overall almost to a T. So that was really great that the sample was representative of all health centers. And additionally, uh, 22 respondents represented health centers serving homeless adults and children, 8% were centers serving residents of public housing, 13% serve agricultural workers and families, and the vast majority are community health centers serving medically underserved and low-income people. And now I'll share findings, some of the main findings from the assessment. 90% of health centers reported having a written emergency management plan. And most base this plan on a risk assessment. Among those who have a plan, 74% indicated that their plan covers pandemics and disease outbreaks such as H1N1 flu pandemic and Ebola. 
In the poll, we asked about the resources health centers have to respond to a public health emergency, and centers were most likely to report having space to set up for mass immunizations and least likely to report having negative pressure isolation rooms or more than a 10-day supply of respiratory protective devices. So that informs the role that uh, centers could play in the event of an emergency. In terms of exercises, such as drills and tabletops, 50% of centers reported having conducted or participated in preparedness exercises in the last 12 months. And 24% report that those exercises covered pandemics. So most health centers have not um, done an exercise in the past 12 months that covers pandemics or outbreaks. 72% reported that in-house staff creates materials for exercises that they use. Segwaying into the topic of partnerships, the majority of health centers, 89%, report partnering with some outside entity in their public health preparedness efforts. And most often this was a local county or regional health department um, or a local preparedness coalition. One key informant shared that um, the onus to forge these relationships is really on the health center and that you can't wait for those relationships to form for you. So this key informant says, you have to engage your community partners to let them know what you can offer. You have to do the outreach. So as I said, most do have these partnerships in place, but fewer have a concrete documented role for themselves in other groups' preparedness plans. So between 42 and 45% of health centers reported that there's a documented role for them in their local health department or local coalition plans, and fewer reported having such a documented role in regional or state plans. And in terms of this role, there is variance among our participating health centers regarding how clearly they can define or view what their role would be in a public health emergency. So some key informants and poll participants had really specific ideas that included that their role would generally be supportive and that they would be there to fill gaps that the um, leader of the response effort would identify, that they could help triage, provide vaccinations, and really be the front line for Worried Well and for public education. But then there were also health centers who reported less clarity um, on what their role would be in the event of an emergency. And this key informant wrote, where do we actually fit? We don't know, and that's our biggest weakness. We asked uh, health centers to report on what they thought was their overarching capacity, how ready they were to respond to a pandemic or outbreak, and 9% reported being completely ready, another 18% reported being almost ready, so that's just under 30% in total, and then another one-third of health centers said they were either not quite ready or not at all ready. And we also asked about um, centers' readiness to be compliant with the CMS rule, and an equal percentage, about 39%, reported that they were almost or completely ready to be in compliance, and another 39% reported that they were not quite ready or not at all ready. And lastly, we asked about barriers and training needs, and here we asked poll participants to label 16 barriers to pandemic preparedness as major, moderate, small, or non-existent barriers. And the ones listed on the slide here were those that were most often named as major or moderate barriers. And they include budget constraints, competing priorities for staff, staffing during an outbreak, knowledge about CMS, having necessary equipment for their response effort, and knowledge about the disease course during an outbreak. And on this slide, you'll see what the top training and technical assistance needs that our poll participants 
uh, reported to us related to pandemics and outbreaks, and you'll also see some overlap with the barriers. So here we ask poll participants to label 19 various topics um, according to how high of a need um, they had for training and technical assistance in these areas. And uh, the top ones are shown on this slide and include staff training on pandemics, tabletop exercises for health centers. So here we're really talking about ones that are specific to the function and characteristics of health centers, um, specifically for those in rural locations. The next three um, training and technical assistance needs are direct overlaps with our barriers, which were CMS requirements, staffing during an emergency, acquiring supplies, and then lastly, understanding their role in terms of what's expected of a health center during an event and state level policies. And this webinar series that we're kicking off today is designed to address some of these identified needs. Now we'll have our second poll. Great. Thanks, Hannah, for priming the poll. So what we'd like to know from this poll is, did your health center have a designated lead emergency preparedness staffer? And if you answered yes to that question, are you that emergency preparedness staffer? And we'll take about a minute to give um, participants the opportunity to respond. Great. All right, a couple more seconds and then we'll be closing. Great. Thank you, Hannah, for closing out the polls. Um, we're going to turn the webinar over now to Tina Wright. Tina? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me today. My name is Tina Wright. I am the Director of Emergency Management for the Massachusetts Primary Care Association, the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. And what I'm going to talk about, because we have a short window of time to talk today, is it's going to be a lot of information. And what I'm going to give you is a basic summary of one of the things that was identified as a top training need, and that was the 73% who answered that they wanted technical assistance uh, and training on the new rule from the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services on Emergency Preparedness Requirements. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, before this rule came out uh, and was enforced over the last couple of years, there really was no written requirement from HRSA, which is, again, the baby's expression is perfect in this slide. People were surprised because they'd heard confusing context in other policy directives. Things like health centers may want to explore developing mutual aid agreements or health centers should integrate into emergency management systems. They're encouraged to be proactive and engaging uh, with coalitions. But it really was never a written requirement until recently. And this was tough to understand because our health center site visit guide specifically referenced it in collaborative relationships, asking health centers about emergency preparedness activities in the service area competition application in the program narrative. They ask you to describe your emergency management planning. And even there's a Form 10 that has to be submitted on a regular basis. That's the Annual Emergency Preparedness P Report. But until this rule, there really was no written requirement uh, from HRSA in particular and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. And this caused varying degrees of preparedness levels across health care, actually, not just health centers, but also in health care. This is the first time a regulatory body has put out requirements. So we had health centers across the country that had either very robust emergency preparedness programs or they were really starting from scratch based on this new rule. So this rule came out as a draft form in December of 2013, and after receiving many hundreds of comments on it, it was published in 2016 and was put into effect in November. And folks had about a year until November of 2017 to implement changes to meet with compliance with the rule. So what does this mean and why this rule? Why now? The goal of the rule is really to improve the continu continuity of care for enrollees in CMS programs, uh, whether Medicaid or Medicare, it doesn't matter. It's part of your conditions for coverage as a healthcare provider. Uh, for other entities, it's also considered conditions of participation and has to do with your billing uh, in particular. This rule really does create commonalities amongst and between healthcare facilities, and it aligns very well with joint commission accreditation, especially for hospitals, but also for ambulatory care, uh, especially recently. Uh, 
And it also is heavily laden with coalition and community integration. So there are lots of different parts of the rule that we're going to just breeze over today, but there will be additional webinars, as um, folks were saying earlier, and uh, opportunities for resources to be passed out as well uh, about meeting the rule. It's the first time a regulatory body or a payer of sorts has these minimum emergency preparedness requirements. And they named 17 different providers and suppliers, including federally qualified health centers. You have to be in compliance with the rule in order to bill Medicaid and Medicare services. And even though there's four core components, I really see it as six steps that a health center needs to take to be in compliance with the rule. Uh, you have to have an emergency plan, policies and procedures, which we have every day in health centers, a communications plan, training and testing program that includes exercises, and they all have to link back and tie back to the results of an all-hazards risk assessment. So these are the 17 providers and suppliers on the slide that you see in front of you. You'll see federally qualified health centers are grouped together with rural health clinics. But over the last couple of decades, health centers have tried to be that sort of one-stop shopping for their patients. So you really have to think about the services that your health center provides. Do you also offer home health services? Do you have a PACE program for all-inclusive care for the elderly? Or do you have satellite clinics that you might have questions about whether or not this rule applies to them? Those two are named in the rule, and even some of them, like the PACE programs and the home health, have additional requirements. We're just going to focus on the federally qualified health center requirements today. And everything we're going to talk about is something you would see in an emergency management program at your health center or under your environment of care committee or your risk management program. It doesn't matter what it's called. Uh, but these are parts of a comprehensive emergency uh, management program. For those health centers that have one, you'll recognize some of the terms we're talking about today. And for those of you who have not been involved and you're not the main person who does emergency preparedness, hopefully this will give you some understanding and a foundation for why it's important to understand uh, these requirements. So the first step is really doing that all hazards risk assessment, because you really can't meet any parts of the rule if you don't know your risks. You have to, uh, it's also referred to as a hazard vulnerability analysis, uh, or HVA. Uh, you have to look at it through the all hazards lens. So not just about pandemics or chemical spills or fire, but having this assessment that you're looking at your facility and your patient uh, populations in an all hazard approach lens. So. For example, in particular for homeless populations, when you're going to look at the impact of a severe winter storm like we just had in our state in Massachusetts over the, overnight last night, the impact on homeless patients is going to be vastly different and much more impactful for your patients than it will be for your actual clinic facility. And this is an analytical tool that takes that into account. Your hazard vulnerability analysis is pretty much a mathematical equation. It's your hazard plus your impact plus your vulnerability is going to equal your risk. So you want to think about your patient demographics, not only for homeless grantees, but also migrant farm worker, agricultural worker grantees, behavioral health patients, their needs, substance addiction patients, what are their needs during an emergency and afterwards. And CMS was specific about it, not being just about your facility and your site location, but also the community in which you're based. And the rule does put that annual review and maintenance requirement on there. Uh, health centers that have done HVAs in the past maybe did them every 18 months or once every two years, but now CMS is really pushing for that annual review and maintenance. There are several models available for free to help a health center do a hazard vulnerability analysis. There are two that we like to direct people towards that are more adaptable for healthcare as opposed to government hazard or community-based hazard vulnerability analyses. The top left-hand uh, picture you'll see is the Kaiser Permanente model. It is by far the most popular model that healthcare facilities use. And the other one is the Children's Hospital of Colorado, HVA2. Both are uh, very helpful with that mathematical equation, very simple to use uh, with your team. The next step that you want to take is creating your emergency plan. You need to base your emergency plan on the risks identified in that HVA, and it can be called an emergency management plan, emergency operations plan. It doesn't matter the terminology as long as it fulfills this need. It also has to address your patient population, but also the types of services your center provides during an emergency. For example, you might not be doing uh, dental cleanings during an emergency, but maybe you'll have one dental chair open in your facility for urgent or emergent needs. And that's just uh, an example. They also state that you need to include business continuity best practices, such as delegations of authority and succession plans. 
And I just wanted to make a note here about the difference. For anyone who might have heard the incident command system uh, terminology sort of thrown around, you have your emergency plan, and then the incident command system is an actual tool. It's not the plan. But a lot of people do use that term interchangeably. So I do like to make note of it when I talk about this topic. Uh, the incident command system is not a plan, but it does provide a means for implementing your plans and coordinating with other organizations. And like we said earlier about coalitions and working with other agencies and building those relationships, the incident command system does help promote that integration and helps you to activate and work with your plan. So I always do like to make that distinction. The next step you're going to make is on your policies and procedures. And this is nothing new. We use policies and procedures in healthcare every single day. Specifically for emergency preparedness, they want it, your policies and procedures to be based on your risk assessment, reference your emergency. Emergency plans and communication plans. You need to include a policy and procedure for tracking of on-duty staff and sheltered patients during an emergency, and have a method for sharing uh, patient medical documentation if a patient has to be transferred to another facility using all those privacy laws, HIPAA, and any other state laws. I did want to point out as well that CMS does require that you have a policy, not an operational guideline, but named policies, which I know sometimes is challenging because they have to go through board approval, but also have a policy for volunteers. And the policy could be in an emergency, we don't use volunteers. As long as it's written down, you'll be fine and it will uh, cover the requirement of the rule. In addition, CMS did state that they want to make sure that there's clinical input into the development of the policies and procedures, whether it's the medical director, a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant. They need to be included in the team that develops these policies and procedures, as well as the uh, preparedness plan. For safe evacuation, the CMS rule did state that health centers need to have proper placement of exit signs. And for shelter in place, plans and uh, policies and procedures, that has an asterisk on it because in the rule it talks a lot about sustenance planning. That is only for inpatient facilities. But for homeless populations, for a homeless grantee health center that is servicing patients in a shelter, you might need to talk to them and find out what their procedures are for making sure that they have those sustenance plans, policies, and procedures in place and incorporate them into your health center's plans for serving your population. Next step is your communications plan. The communications plan needs to reference back to the emergency plan. It has to comply with uh, federal and state laws. Think about your risks as well uh, for what's identified in your hazard vulnerability analysis. For if you lose uh, your IT system, for example, with voice over IP, you have to think of a backup system and make sure it's included in your plan for how would you communicate if you had no telephone or no internet. It needs to facilitate both internal communication and external, so internal being staff and patients. External is your project officer, for example, at HRSA, the local public health department, your primary care association. Uh, any of those would be part of that communication process. In addition to that, and this goes again back to those relationship building and making sure that you are connected locally, is being able to communicate to the local incident commander your facility's ability to provide assistance before, during, and after an event. So those relationships really need to be built in advance to be included in your communications plans. And again, that alternate means of communication in case of a disruption of service. For training and testing, this is where I feel we have the biggest challenge as federally qualified health centers. You train your staff regularly. This is specific to emergency preparedness. They, you have to compare to your risk assessment, train on your plans and your policies and procedures. You have to update these annually and train on them annually. And it also has to be consistent for the expected roles of your staff at the health center. Staff have to demonstrate knowledge, and there needs to be documentation. We can't say that enough. Document, document, document. A CMS audit is a documentation trail. And then we pulled out a sample from the surveyor guidance. If you were to have a CMS audit, for example, a surveyor would ask for copies of your uh, emergency preparedness training. They would want to interview your staff to verify that they're knowledgeable about the emergency procedures or even that they know where to find them if they don't know them off the top of their head. They're going to want to review samples of your training files. So this is just one sample. And of course, the surveyor guidance is available and will provide links to materials that will give you more information. And for testing, that's where these exercises come into play. 
not only do you have to do a full-scale exercise, you actually have to do two exercises. One could be a tabletop uh, discussion-based exercise, but the other one has to be that full-scale exercise, and that's the big one. A full-scale exercise is a multidiscipline, multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency, boots-on-the-ground, operations-based, things-moving-around type of exercise, which is a big ask for a health center. Uh, for better or worse, an actual emergency that does activate your plan will qualify for this full-scale exercise requirement as long as it's documented. And again, back to that documentation. And it will it'll, uh, represent that full-scale exercise for one year after the event. So one year from that activation, it will cover that requirement. And Training and exercises are, are really complicated, uh, and the grid that I have here, if you think of each of these boxes as an ob uh, objective or a goal that you want to test in an exercise, you'll see the tabletop, you're testing three to five objectives. It's a low-stress environment, it's, it's a springboard for further planning, and the full-scale exercise, you'll see it's very complex, it has multiple uh, goals and objectives, and it really is that full, that multi-jurisdictional. That's the biggest part, that how do you bring in all those partners if you're a small health center? And that's where those coalition relationships really can be helpful. Uh, this is the definitions that they're using in the guidance. You'll see the full scale is operations-based. It's that multi-agency, multi-jurisdictional, boots on the ground response activities, like clinical staff treating mock patients, for example, uh, would be one example of how that would work. A tabletop exercise is uh, scenario-based, it's discussion-based, it's a very informal setting. You're looking at your plans and you're having a conversation about that. So that's, that's the second exercise. And for documenting your exercises, at a minimum, your reports should include what was supposed to happen, what actually happened, what worked well, what can be improved, and then having a plan for implementing the improvements with a timeline. And this is just very basic. I won't talk much about the integrated health system option, but know that if you are a health center organization that has multiple sites, six or seven sites, you technically would be an integrated health system because you'd have one emergency management program that then would have site-specific annexes and appendices that would have the details specific to those facilities and locations. CMS has said failure to meet these requirements will result in termination from CMS programs, but they sort of softened that language a little bit and said that they'll go through the same general enforcement procedures for any other no, uh, CMS noncompliance. So that's a good thing. When we look at our patient demographics and the amount of Medicare and Medicaid patients that are seen at health centers, that's a big deal to us. Maybe not so much for others, but for us at, in federally qualified health centers, it does make a big impact. This link here and this information on this slide about healthcare coalitions is very generic. It's just to point you in a direction to learn more about healthcare coalitions. But the rule in itself was very heavily laden with coalition integration language. Uh, coalitions do tend to offer opportunities and resources for the members of the coalition. And this is where health centers can go to to try to find opportunities to participate in full-scale exercises, but also to get additional training and exercises in. Uh, they can also help facilitate communication. And even when we think about coalitions, uh, last year, at, I believe mid-year in June, uh, there were over 476 healthcare coalitions, and there's one for every state across the United States. So definitely keep reaching out. It takes a long time and investment to make those uh, relationships. So we highly recommend that people continue to reach out, put yourself on agendas, introduce yourself, but definitely move towards working with those coalitions to meet these requirements. We're going to hold our questions, but we're going to move on to Alex and our next poll. So I'm going to pass it back to Christine to do the next poll. Thanks, Tina. Um, we, uh, Hannah, if you can prime up that next poll, looks like it's up. Um, so we are looking at, on a scale of one to five, one being not at all prepared and five being extremely prepared, how prepared is your health center to respond in the event of an emergency? We'll take, a, take about a minute to have participants respond. Oh, I see, see 38 participants on this webinar. I wonder if we can get a couple more people to respond to the poll. Excellent. And uh, I think you can, um, you can close that poll out. 
Thank you so much. Um, we are going to transition the webinar to our final presenter for, the, um, for today's webinar. Um, and then after Alex's presentation, we will um, field questions. So as we're um, sort of winding down the webinar, if there are questions that you have that have been generated through this discussion, I really encourage you to pose them in the, um, the Q&A box um, on your screen. Um, and at this point, Alex, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you. Thank you, Christine. Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Lipovsev, and I um, work for Community Healthcare Association in New York State, Chikinis, and I run our emergency management program for uh, the PCA. So what we wanted to do for you is uh, we are focusing on the resources for public health preparedness, and we are zooming in on some of those resources that we think uh, you will find uh, useful. To start, though, I wanted to go back for a second to uh, the report that Gabrielle uh, reviewed earlier, and there were top areas of need identified in that report. Um, and those needs are on your screens. It's the CMS Emergency Preparedness Final Rule overall, the one that Tina just reviewed, and uh, we also have training staff and running exercises, specifically tabletops. So if you think about it, uh, the needs do fall under the rule itself, but also, again, it's a highlight that training staff and running exercises or testing component is probably more challenging than the others. So your first stop should be as per Tracy. As per is the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, and Tracy is the Technical Resources Assistance Center Information Exchange Service. It has been identified as the official training and technical assistance uh, space for uh, CMS emergency preparedness rule implementation. Um, so they have partnered with CMS to provide all sorts of resources to all entities affected by the rule, and there are 17 provider supply types that uh, you saw on your screen earlier. And what does this do? If you haven't seen Tracy, you should absolutely go and explore this site. There's three areas. One is uh, technical resources itself. There is different collection, topic collections. There is a devoted collection on FQHCs and ambulatory care sites. Uh, so those are the resources that have been selected to represent the needs specifically of FQHCs. Um, also, assistance center is an area where you can request. You can uh, log a request for help if you're trying to find or establish something you're having a hard time um, looking for that resource. That's uh, the spot where you should go. And information exchange is um, a a, an opportunity for you to connect with your peers and also start a topic for discussion. It's uh, almost like a discussion board. Also, the good news and the bad news here is that there is so much information available already. Please don't reinvent the wheel. The good news is that probably what you need to do has been already created, and you just need to find it. The bad news is because it has been created, there is multiple resources out there, and sometimes it's very challenging to go and find exactly what you need. So hopefully what we're doing here with you is to um, allow you um, some direction in which you need to go. Um, again, let's zoom in on the rule. So we wanted to present some resources that will follow under the umbrella of the rule itself. And as Tina reviewed, um, these are the must-have elements, risk assessment and emergency planning, policies and procedures, communication plan and training and testing. Let's have a look at the risk assessment and emergency planning as the core element one and what resources you need to be aware of in our opinion. Um, the first one is if you have never written an emergency operations plan or emergency management plan or comprehensive emergency management plan, no matter how you call it, it's the plan itself that defines your program and describes your program. If you, have, if you haven't done it, this is the definitive guidance that's, that was written by FEMA, and it provides very clear structure. If you have no idea where to start, how to write a plan um, that you must have now based on the CMS rule, this is your document. It really goes into the detail what those plan should be. Those were the positives. On the negative side, this guidance has been written for the government. So you need to keep that in mind when you're reading this, because some areas may go into too much detail, may be a bit too complicated, and may be a bit too heavy in language. That is very heavily governmental. However, um, you in, at least should be aware of this resource uh, when you're trying to create emergency management plans for your FQHCs. Also, Tina has reviewed 
uh, Kaiser Permanente tool for hazard vulnerability analysis. Um, we wanted to point out a couple of other tools. This one, Empower Map 2.0, is a service that is um, uh, compiled through Medicare beneficiary data for electricity dependent and assistive equipment people who use that. And you can actually zoom in on the zip code and see who you have. So this is uh, to go into your communities that you need to um, consider when you're planning your hazards and also um, the uh, specific populations that you're treating. Speaking of populations, this is another tool, Social Vulnerability Index, SVI. It's compiled by the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and it um, uses U.S. Census data to give you um, several uh, domains for social vulnerability. You can have overall vulnerability, but you can also look at socioeconomic theme, household composition, minority status, housing. It's all helpful when you're looking at your community and looking at what kind of hazards you are dealing with and who you would be serving in case of emergencies. Also another example of a tool that's available. By the way, all of the resources that we're presenting here are free and you don't need to pay anything for them. This tool is the FEMA Flood Map Service Center. This is on the national level. Your locality may have a similar tool just for your local government. Uh, but this one, again, if you type in a, an address or zip code, it will tell you what kind of flooding hazard you may have. Again, just an example to inspire you to go in that direction. Policies and procedures in this subdomain, and we're moving very fast, and I apologize for this, but because we don't have a lot of time, uh, we have to go pretty fast here. In this domain, I'd like you to um, keep in mind um, this resource, ECRI Institute. It's, um, ECRI is an excellent, excellent resource. Uh, the reason why I'm putting it under the policies and procedures is because, first of all, they recently had an excellent webinar on how to create effective policies and procedures. Also, this is available to all FQHCs through the HRSA agreement between ECRI and HRSA. As an FQHC or PCA, you have access for free. You have to register and ask for uh, access, but you can have it. And in it, there's tons of topics um, like health information technology privacy, uh, emergency preparedness, workplace violence, um, et cetera, et cetera, not to mention that they are uh, focus is creating safe, more effective healthcare. So anything to do with that um, is your place um, to get sample policies and procedures, all sorts of tools and assessment tools, et cetera. So don't um, hesitate to go and ask for access for this. Communication plan. Um, CDC is probably the authority on communication um, in crisis and emergencies. And specifically, since we're talking about public health preparedness, um, we wanted to point out this tool. They have, if you go to this website, they have a manual and tools on how to create communication plans for emergencies. Again, not to belabor the topic, but this is uh, created for government, but there's tons of um, information and knowledge to be taken from the manual itself, so please review that. And for um, the policy that you now need to have on releasing medical information, having safe releases of information during emergencies, uh, we wanted to point out this resource, it has to do with HIPAA, and in there there is a tool that you can use. There's a link on this website for tool for disclosures for emergency preparedness. It's a decision tool that you can utilize uh, to have a look whether you, need, you are able or not able to disclose information and in what scenarios. Training and testing. So training and testing is one of those challenging, um, and I apologize for the small um, uh, font here. It's a, sh a screenshot, but this is the place where you need to start. If you don't know where to start, please go here. And the reason is, is that FEMA Emergency Management Institute, EMI, has fantastic resources on all sorts of emergency preparedness topics. It can, it can range from the foundations of what emergency management is, ending with something specific like how to respond to radiological weapons. Um, in there, there's an independent study section where you can get online courses. Um, you can create your own training programs for staff based on those online courses. You can get um, uh, certificates for completion, and you can create a robust training program on emergency preparedness topics be, uh, using these resources. There are other programs within the Emergency Management Institute, uh, such as in-person courses, et cetera, et cetera. Please go have a look at what's available. It's a fantastic, fantastic resource for you to know. Speaking of free resources, and I like free resources because we don't have much money to spend on this stuff, but there's free 
printed publications that are available. The, I'm giving you three links here. One is to ready.gov, another one is for the uh, Federal Trade Commission, and for CDC. Federal Trade Commission is uh, an example on your left data breaches. Uh, they have tons of printed brochures, plans for cybersecurity, for example. Um, FEMA ready.gov initiative has tons of resources for uh, personal preparedness for trainings that you can have with your staff. And it's wonderful to give away things. People like to walk away with uh, some brochures um, by um, after participating in a training session, for example. And CDC, of course, has tons of public health-specific uh, emergency preparedness resources, such as how to wash your hands properly, um, uh, the Example you see on your screen is the population monitoring in radiation emergencies. They have a lot of resources that you can review and see if you will find them useful. Speaking of exercises and uh, running them, so um, HC, it's the um, Homeland Security Emergency uh, Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program. Sorry, this program has tons of resources and templates that you can utilize. So if you go to this web link, you will have access to every single template that HCIP has ever used. Um, again, the caveat here is that you need to review what uh, your needs are for um, those specific templates. CMS does not require you to use a specific template format, so please use your judgment in how to adjust what's available. Um, this is an example of a tabletop exercise package. So if you go to this web link, you can download from Department of Homeland Security a whole packet of the cyber tabletop exercise. Um, again, it will give you everything, including the documentation, including the templates for uh, the organization of the exercise and for the players, for the organizers, etc. Please go have a look and see if you can download this and use this in your FQHCs. Also, um, just general information on other sources of information and um, training exercises and just uh, resources in general. CDC has a fantastic section on emergency preparedness and response. They have topics such as shelter in place, uh, clinical areas such as uh, dealing with Zika, flu, et cetera, and coping uh, with disasters, et cetera. National Library of Medicine is a fantastic resource. Um, it's a bonanza of information specifically for um, hazard specific planning. Um, if you are ri uh, writing your plan for a specific um, emergency that you identified in your hazard vulnerability analysis, so this is a place to go. Also wanted to point out, again, going back to the populations you're serving, because we're all different in FQHCs and you may serve different kinds of populations, this section specifically talks about special populations and their uh, specifications of what to do with older adults in emergencies, hearing impaired, visually impaired, etc. cetera. Uh, there's foreign language materials that are available here if you're serving immigrants. So please go have a look and see what you can use. Another one um, is the SAMHSA website. It's the Disaster Distress Helpline that pro provides services for con uh, counseling during emergencies and disasters, and it's a, an authority for um, uh, psychological first aid. U.S. CERT, we're all uh, affected by cybersecurity. This is the resource that you need to know. Please subscribe to the news um, security alerts. But here you can also, this is a space to report um, a crime, a cybersecurity crime. Please go explore what resources they have. They have also publications and related resources that you see in the top menu there on the slide uh, screenshot. Uh, American Red Cross, among other organizations that are pretty well known for their resources. Uh, so this is another great uh, location to identify resources that are hazard specific. Um, and mobile applications, just giving you a few, for example, FEMA app gives you access to current information, GPS, based on your GPS location, you can get alerts about severe weather. Um, Red Cross Hurricane app allows you to track hurricanes live, et cetera. So don't forget about that option as well. And last but not least is there are free publications, believe it or not, you can subscribe for free to receive these magazines, Emergency Magazine, 
uh, sorry, emergency management and campus safety. Emergency management, for example, talked about flu pandemic way before we are dealing with this right now, but they um, gave scenarios of what to do as an organization, and campus safety, safety focuses mostly on workplace violence, um, um, but it's another good resource. And with that, uh, we're going back to Christine to uh, start with the question and answer session. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate you taking the time to outline the comprehensive list of resources available to health centers. Um, I want to remind everyone on the webinar that um, you can copy and follow the instructions to claim your CME credit for this session. Um, the text in code will only be available now and credit must be claimed within 24 hours. Um, and a survey will be delivered to you via email. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to um, type in the chat box. Um, I want to thank all of the presenters today for your thoughtful and comprehensive overview of Health Center's role in the context of public health preparedness. Um, we have provided the email addresses for all of our presenters, and please feel free to follow up with them directly with any content-specific information that um, we don't uh, cover uh, in this last part of our webinar series. Um, there were a couple questions that came through, um, but I actually have a quick question for Alex that, um, that, that really struck me that there is so much information out there available to health centers. Um, if you were to pick the top three resources, if you had a health center um, that came to you with, with questions on how to build out their preparedness plan, what would be the top three resources out of the resources that you listed that you would refer them to? I would start absolutely with Asper Tracy because this is the beginning point for everything. Uh, it will give you a lot of information and the direction in which to go. I would then go most likely to FEMA Emergency Management Institute to the independent study courses for online information. Even if you're charged with uh, doing the emergency preparedness in the health center and you want to you know, brush up on some of your knowledge or learn something, this is an excellent um, starting point. And because exercises and uh, training is such a difficult area that's now required, I would uh, go to either FEMA HC um, program and learn how to run effective exercises because they have tons of information and resources and interpretation of what to do. And I guess the third would uh, also be shared with ECRI Institute because I think it's an excellent place for safety. Uh, it may be a bit short on some other areas, but um, because it is devoted to clinical practices and health centers, um, it, it's an excellent resource as well. Great. Thanks, Alex. And then uh, just a quick um, follow-up question to that. Should health centers expect that these resources are tailored to, in a, a language for health centers, or should they be expected to um, adapt the resources that you suggested um, in their context? Like, I guess the question is, um, is the audience directed towards health centers, or should health centers who are accessing these resources be expected to have to adapt them a bit? So most likely, when you, start for, uh, when you first start accessing um, these resources, you'll be struck by how non FQHC focused all of these resources are. And it may put you off at the beginning, but I think with some time and experience you will start to learn, well, it will be applicable for me and it won't be applicable for me. So don't be scared to go and start using these resources. You will naturally identify where some of the things can be dropped, like in CDC manual and the communications. There's a whole section on public health local departments that may not be applicable to you. Or in HC, there's like all these uh, jurisdictions, language, etc. It's governmental. So. With that in mind, you can uh, start dropping some of these things off. But to summarize the question, no, they're not uh, specifically devoted to uh, health centers except Tracy topic collection on FQHCs, and health centers should be really prepared on going in and um, learning how to pick and choose what's applicable to them, which is sometimes a challenge. Great. Thank you, Alex. I have two more questions queued up, and then, I, um, and then we will be closing out the webinar. Um, there was a question from Samantha, um, and I'm actually going to um, pose this to Gabrielle. Um, Samantha's question was, were there any health centers from U.S. territories included in the assessment that you spoke about in the beginning of the webinar? 
Sure, that's a great question. And the online poll was sent to all FQHCs in the country, including those in the U.S. territories. In terms of our respondents, we had six FQHCs from Puerto Rico and one from another U.S. territory. Great, thanks, Gabrielle. Um, and then the last question is from Jennifer. Um, and, and Tina, I'm going to actually have you respond to this. Um, Jennifer asks, does the full-scale exercise have to be included in the hazard vulnerability assessment? She said, in, um, for example, if we coordinate with other agencies and the exercise is not one we identify that is likely to happen, like a radi radiological event, um, when teaming up with a county emergency exercise to mock treat patients. And That's then a great she had a Oops, sorry. She had a follow-up question to that, which is, is it a requirement to have an ICS integrated into a plan? No, ahead, thank you, Jennifer, ahead. for those questions. Those are great questions. Um, in particular, about the full-scale exercise, if you are participating with another organization on a full-scale exercise, even if the generic topic of the exercise scenario is something that did not come up in your specific hazard vulnerability analysis, the way you can meet the requirement by participating with them is making sure that your testing in your facility, something that did come up as a, ha as a risk area in your vulnerability analysis. So even if the scenario is radiation-based and perhaps part of your scenario, your hazard vulnerability analysis, uh, one of your risks might have been communications failure, then you would test your facility to the communications failure as part of the full-scale exercise on radiation. Um, so I hope that answers your question a little bit. And uh, the requirement around ICS, no, it is not required that you use the incident command system. It's just a best practice across um, emergency management and does really help with those um, integrating into other organizations uh, planning processes as well. Uh, it's not required at all. Uh, the good thing about the CMS rule is that they, didn't, they weren't prescriptive to any methods or models, and they really left it vague for that purpose, uh, although sometimes that can also be a challenge to find what model is going to work for your center. Great. So I hope thanks, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Tina. Um, Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us on today's webinar. A link of the archive webinar will be available on, on um, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council's website, www.nhchc.org, at the conclusion of their spring virtual training. Again, I just want to remind you, please copy and follow the instructions to claim your CME credit for this session. Um, the text in code will only be available now, and again, credit must be claimed within 24 hours. And just again as a reminder, each survey will be delivered to you via email. Um, and I wanted to just remind everyone, if you have um, additional questions, um, we have additional training opportunities coming up um, in the next couple weeks um, for more public health preparedness training opportunities for health centers. Join us for the following webinar series. Um, beginning next Tuesday, March 13th, we will be discussing navigating the CMS emergency preparedness rule. Um, we'll reconvene on March 20th to discuss bolstering health center staff readiness for an outbreak. And then finally, on March 27th, we will close the series with understanding and advancing the health center role in local emergency response. Um, for more information,